It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The Congressional Progressive Caucus of the Democratic Party here in the U.S. annually hosts a strategy treat, retreat in Baltimore. This year, they have invited several EU progressive left parties for, to join them. And in our studio today, we are joined by one of them, Yanis Borunus. He is a member of a political secretariat of the governing party Syriza in Greece, and he heads uh, or his responsibilities lie in the area of European and international affairs. I thank you for joining us today. Nice to meet you. Syriza and the struggle of the Greek people are near and dear to us at The Real News because we've been covering uh, the rise of Syriza and the struggles that Syriza and the people of uh, Greece have gone through in terms of the debt crisis, in terms of the forced austerity on the people of uh, Greece. What is it that you're hoping to achieve in terms of this uh, conversation, dialogue you're having with the Democratic Party and their Progressive Caucus? First of all, to raise awareness about the Greek case. Uh, everybody discussed about the Greek tragedy of the previous eight years, but now it's time to, to talk about the rebirth of Greece. Now it's time to talk about the clear exit of Greece from the Memoranda of Austerity, because the current three-year program that we have painfully agreed and compromised with the European Union and the IMF comes to an end in August 2018. And this government is fighting, and it will fight against until the end, to have a clear exit from this program, which means that we will do our best not to need another institutional credit line, another institutional loan coming from the EU, the European Central Bank, and the IMF. We want to to make our country solvent so that it will be able to go back for credit to the financial markets and thus not be dependent by this constant monitoring by the institutions that uh, are our lenders. In this way, we will manage to expand our fiscal space of maneuver. And this means expanding our maneuvers concerning social policies because this is our main focus. Even in times of austerity in the last three years, we managed to achieve many important things in the sectors that we consider as the most valuable for the social majority. And this is healthcare, education, and the welfare state. Despite the very strict rules of the current program, we have managed to overachieve in our fiscal targets and redistribute these achievements to the people uh, as much as we can. And this is a good sign that we are moving towards, as I told you already, towards a clear exit from the program, which will allow us to restore the part of our lost sovereignty. And also, as Portugal did after their exit from their memorandum, start uh, restoring, first of all, collective contracts, collective bargaining, which have been forbidden for Greece for the last five years, and also start raising the minimum wage, which is one of the landmark targets for our government. So I'm here to raise awareness about all these things. All right, raise those awarenesses in terms of what are the indicators in the economy that may, allows you to speak in these terms that you will be able to renegotiate in more favorable terms or eliminate uh, the um, type of memorandum that was issued to Greece um, in the last time around, what are the economic indicators that gives you this favorability in terms of trying to convince those that you're on a different track? First of all, in the last two years, we have been overachieving in terms of primary surpluses, which has given us the opportunity to redistribute a part of these surpluses in Christmas 2016 and Christmas 2017 to hundreds of thousands of low pensioners and unemployed youth through extra allowances, one-off allowances. Uh, secondly, we are waiting for the final calculations, which will be issued this month. Uh, but our estimation is that we finished uh, 2017 with uh, a growth that will approach 2%. And this is the first time that Greece not only um, avoids a recession, but uh, sees an actual growth happening. 
Of course, this is what we call the well-being of numbers. The question is how to translate these official numbers, uh, positive outcome, to positive changes for the daily life of the social majority, the people that have suffered the most from the crisis. And as I told you, our utmost priorities are healthcare, education, welfare state. Uh, we have been trying a lot and we have achieved things that might have been unimaginable for the old political regime, uh, which was firing people from the public sector, closing down hospitals, closing down schools. At this time, after three years of Syriza and government, we have a totally reversed image. We have a, pro a program of 12,500 hirings in the public health care system since 2016, and it will expand. We have been doing the same in public schools. We have been doing the same in research and development. It's the first time that the public spending for research and development is actually visible in the years of the crisis. And of course, we have established many measures concerning the welfare state that have created a protective net for the people. One of them is the guaranteed minimum income which influences about 600,000 people right now in Greece. We have been advancing in such ways that will allow us to lead the victims of the crisis out of it. So, we have good official numbers. We have been step by step, despite the existing great difficulties, improving the daily life of the poor. These are two indicators that go hand in hand. Third indicator will be the labor market, and as I told you before, for us, this is one of the main aims on our way to finishing and exiting this program in August. How to restore collective contracts, how to restore the minimum wage and start increasing it. Because, in my opinion, this is not only, these are not only reforms that will improve people's lives. This is also a political clash with the neoliberal elites in Europe after so many years of degradation of labor relations. Uh, it is time for a government, just like Portugal did in the last two years, to show that there's a different way, that there's a way of restoring social rights and not diminishing them. And we are positive that we're going to achieve this. The kind of privatization that Syriza has been engaged in is counterproductive to what you're talking about. Uh, let's take the example of the port of uh, Piraeus and the privatization of a port that has demonstrated that it can function on its own uh, merits and its own finances in terms of the, uh, uh, what it costs to run the port. It also could demonstrate that it is a kind of uh, revenue generation that the state and the government needs, um, and yet it was sold off to uh, Costco, which is a which is a, a Chinese company, at a fire sale price. What, why does Syriza engage in this kind of activity, and what was what made it necessary to sell that? First of all, I already talked about a very painful compromise, which we were forced to agree upon after a very clear blackmailing by the EU, the, EU, the European Central Bank and the IMF in July 2015 after the historic referendum in Greece. This painful compromise also included a program of privatizations. What we achieved on that area in this current memorandum is that in contrast to the model privatizations were made during the old establishment governments and the previous years of the crisis, instead of selling off our public assets, we are creating a state fund for the evaluation and the um, development of state assets. This does not mean necessarily that we're going to privatize all the public services or public assets that are transferred to the ownership of this fund. But we will take advantage of them, for example, in case of hundreds of empty state-owned build, state buildings that we're going to rent in order to have more revenues. But let me come to the specific question about the Port of Piraeus. First of all, the, port, the partial privatization of the Port of Piraeus was not finalized by our government. It was finalized by the previous government of Greece. So when we undertook governmental responsibility, the port was partially privatized already. What we did, in dialogue and 
in negotiations with Costco, which is a state Chinese company, is that we renegotiated the contract. The results, the concrete results of this renegotiation are in favor of the workers of the port. First of all, we should say, and this is not... Why is it in favor of I, I will explain, okay. but let me give you another detail. We should not underestimate the fact that the Chinese side, which is a state company of China, uh, did what they promised. They have increased the investment in the port in times that public investment for further development of infrastructure, even of railway connection from the port, would have been actually impossible concerning if we judge from the financial state of the, of the state and the priorities we have. Second thing is that they fulfilled the terms that we put for workers' rights. And let me come to the specific results. We have the first collective contract signed a few weeks ago at the port, collective agreement achieved between the employers, which includes the Chinese side, the trade unions, with the mediation of the government. It is the, po it is the first post-bailout collective contract even before the end of the bailout. It increased the starting net wage for the employees to 1,800 euro, uh, which is an unthinkable number if we think with the terms of the previous old political regime of the neoliberals. It restored all family and holiday allowances. All the holiday schemes that existed in the past, all the special allowances having to do with uh, the difficult conditions of work in some sectors of the port. So it is, I repeat, for us it is important that we have the agreement, the conclusion of the first, first post-bailout type of collective contract even before the end of the bailout program. And in these terms, the cooperation with the Chinese side has not been proved to be disastrous for public interest and workers' interest. Of course, this is not the case with all the privatizations that have been made under the violent compromise of the current program. Uh, but what our government is trying to do is at least ameliorate the consequences by giving extra incentives, for example, uh, to citizens of um, islands whose, uh, whose airports have been privatized. To give them extra incentives, for example, now we are talking about special measures that will lower the cost of transportation through water or air in areas that their airports have been privatized and where uh, transport had already been very expensive, very costly for uh, citizens, but also for merchants and uh, commerce. Um, it's not always easy to cope with this program. And it's, all, it's not always easy to cope with the European Union and <laughs> even more with an IMF uh, ruled by those who are ruling them. Are you suggesting that part of the plan on the part uh, on the part of Syriza is to begin to deprivatize uh, these airports, as you say, or the transportation, um, to lower the cost for ordinary citizens? Part of the plan is to ameliorate the consequences of a part of the privatizations that have been has been harmful for public interest and citizens' interest. Actually, recently, we renationalized a service. And this is not widely discussed. We renationalized the transport system of Thessaloniki, the biggest city of Greece, which was owned by a private company, which was fed with state money for decades. And they produced enormous scandals of misuse of public funds. But previous governments never touched, put their hands on this company. A few months ago, Syriza government was the one to renationalize the transport system, the transport company of Thessaloniki. And despite the arguments and the fight on behalf of the right-wing opposition, the transport system is greatly improved in the last months. The, the buses are being very quickly renewed. And uh, the new board of the company, appointed by the government, 
has already managed not only to reveal the scandals of the previous decades, which means that the private owners will have to answer to the justice system about what they did with public money, but it has also managed to rearrange the budget in such a way that the, the company currently is finishing 2017 with an enormous surplus. What is our strategy in total when we're facing all these very difficult challenges? I think that Chomsky described it very, way, very well when he was trying to describe the first term, term of Lula's government in Brazil. He said that the strategy was to expand the room of the cage. Syriza, when we reached the critical point in July 2015, Syriza acknowledged the dead end. We had to choose between two solutions, which were bad, really bad for the Greek people. So we had to choose this path that would be less destructive. We decided to choose this path, the current path, to sign a painful compromise, which would at least give us the opportunity, through the very hard negotiations that we're continuing until today, give us the opportunity to open the door for an exit of this uh, downward spiral of the last years of the crisis. We understood that the other choice was dreadful, because the other choice would be to exit very violently the Eurozone. And this would mean that a very weak economy of the European South, only 2% of the European GDP, would be exposed to very violent consecutive devaluations of the new national currency. Because we didn't have the productive basis, as Argentina had, for example, or we didn't have any foreign currency reserves in order to support the exchange rate of the new national currency. In a devastated economy, consecutive devaluations of a new national currency would mean devastation of the workers and pensioners, would mean the de immediate devastation of the social majority, the people we want to protect. Of course, they are suffering with the memoranda of austerity, but we restored stability of the country, we managed to stop the degradation of the economy, and the economy is growing right now. This is the opening of a window. I'm not saying that all things are well. There are very big structural problems of the Greek economy that have to do both with the neoliberal recipe that has been applied in the last decades, but also with particular characteristics of the Greek uh, productive mechanism, productive system, and also the economy, the clientelist system, the extensive corruption that was fed with enormous public funds all the previous four decades. This is a long way. This is not a 100 meters uh, run. And uh, this is a marathon. <laughs> it, is, it is really a marathon. And I think that we made the right choice because it starts to become visible day by day, slowly, gradually, but it starts becoming visible that we can actually make it. And if you judge by the course of things in Portugal, we're becoming even more optimistic. In Portugal, we have a social democratic government a center-left government, minority government, which is supported by the Communist Party and the Left Bloc and the Green Party, according to a governmental contract with these smaller parties of the left. As long as the socialist government followed and honored the terms of this governmental contract, the economy is growing faster after the exit from the memorandum. They have managed to start increasing gradually the minimum wage and restoring social rights. We are following the same recipe. All right. Um, it is important that you mention the word corruption, because as you know, <laughs> know very well uh, that, uh, <coughs> that uh, Syriza and the government has been hit by a huge corruption scandal. Let's take that up in our next segment. And uh, um, I've been speaking with Yanis Burnus. He's joining me uh, here in our Baltimore studios. He's a political secretariat uh, leader of the governing party of Syriza. Thank you for joining us for now.